Okay, I hope I'm recording. Anyway, let's talk a little bit about process safety or just plain safety for that matter. I was uh, developing this as a short course to give to industry, but I never really quite make it, made it. I have a different approach or a little bit different approach to safety, just to give it a different slant. Uh, my approach is coming from a, from the point of view of pilot plant, <clears throat> pilot plant. Uh, background to references that I, I use. This is all pretty much uh, uh, original. I don't think I've taken much from other people. Anyway, let's start out with an introduction, different levels of safety, types of accidents, accident scenarios, accident hunting, procedures, uh, safety problems, fail safe systems and controls, you know, close out. Anyway, action, accidents change everything. I don't know. Fundamentally, you should recognize that if an accident, major accident happens, everything changes. Give you a case in point. Here we have Exxon Refinery. Here we have West Pharmaceuticals, Williams Olfen. Anyway, as you can see, uh, the day previous, people went to actually work here. And next day, there's no place for people to go to work. And hopefully nobody died in any of these, but I suspect it might have happened. Anyway, even the best of the best, like ExxonMobil, have accidents. ExxonMobil uh, has the reputation of only hiring the very best out of college. And uh, the very best even have accidents. Anyway, what we want to do is look at safety a little bit differently, take a more generic approach, and maybe from a process development, a scale up point of view, possibly generate new approaches to safety. I doubt if we're going to do that, but just take a look at scale up version of safety. Many processes uh, are controlled bombs. It's just unfortunate. I mean, they basically control palms operating at or near safety limits. Process optimums occur in the same region. Profitable, profitable operations often are in the verge of trouble. Many processes are operating just below the point of failure. Major reasons for safety consideration. Safety is paramount in that you may not have a plant after an accident, a major accident. So it's something to be uh, aware of. Different levels of safety. Uh, well, for lack of a better name or better names, it's called standard, go ahead and excellent. Standard safety, common sense, routine. Need to be current, I don't know. Are the fire extinguishers in the right place? Have they been checked? Do people know how to use them? Have they been used at all? The uh, question is, is safety boring at this level? Okay, uh, that's a question. Safety is not a boring item that has to be tolerated. Should not be that. Safety sh is not something that is done monthly. It's done all the time. Good safety comes from good process understanding. That's very true. You must understand your process to have a safe operation. Some of the examples that are available, uh, chemical safety board videos show a significant lack of process understanding and a lot of, you know, a lot of accidents. The other thing that uh, goes along with good process safety is also management. Mm -hmm. Management can take a very positive attitude towards safety a lukewarm attitude towards safety, or actually a hostile view towards safety. So um, again, good process understanding, uh, tech and good management as well. Information originates from design engineers, prior experience. Desi design engineers should incorporate safety in their designs. Prior experience, very important. Operators and engineers who run the process 
the maintenance. Maintenance should be in uh, the safety area. Uh, maintenance should interact with the design engineers, should interact with the operators and engineers running the process. No interaction like that takes place, then you have a you could potentially have a significant problem. New process insights may be gained. So we're going to put good safety right into process design and maybe even incorporate it after the process is up and running. Example of poor communications. This is directed towards poor communications as well. Poor communications haunt industry. There's no, there's no question about it. An example, a, a very prestigious specialty chemical company had a process that they studied it in the lab. And <clears throat> everything worked fantastic in the lab. So they went ahead and said, well, we can skip the scale up phase of the process and went directly into the plant operations. And when the process started up, everything went perfectly. Your process control equipment said that everything worked perfectly. Unfortunately, they opened the valve to let the product out and nothing came out. After a lot of uh, concern that plant people called up uh, lab and they were talking a lot about this. Eventually, the plant people opened up the reactor, and there was the product all balled up on the reactor, on the reactor impeller. And the uh, plant people said, this is all balled up on the impeller. And the lab people said, well, that happened to us all the time. So there's an example of poor communication. Now, this stuff balling up on uh, the impeller could have been a very hazardous condition, could have led to serious problems. Now the lab, uh, lab uh, people responded that this wasn't a major problem for them since uh, all they did was in the lab was pick up the reactor and shake it. So that's a process that's not available in the plant. So you can't pick up a 10,000 gallon reactor and shake it. So two, fold, uh, two situations, third, poor communications, a... Um, Arrogance that says that you don't need uh, to do a scale up, intermediate scale up uh, study. And then you have situations where you can't do what's needed in the plant. So you are violated procedures, I'm sure, process procedures, and you've gone under, gone down a new process prop, new process path, a new process path, which could lead to a major accidents. I also like to learn from everybody. Everybody can be a source of information. If you're looking for somebody who knows everything, you'll never find that person. Anyway. So one needs good process understanding, one needs to pay attention. May good process understanding, good management, and needs to pay attention. Example would be say dryer fires are quite common. Uh, fires should be planned for, anticipated, and the design of the, and incorporated in the design of reactors, uh, excuse me, in design of dryers. Potentially, you could use a self inertizing system or have a way of cutting off the oxygen. You might think of putting in a sprinkler system, but that may cause problems in the duct work and may cause problems generally. Uh, so you may not want to do uh, sprinkler systems. Sprinkler systems may cause additional problems. Anyway, uh, so you anticipate failure and you design away from it. Right. Excellent safety uh, comes from being prepared for the unexpected, for the improbable, and for the very improbable, right? So this, the old view, you have a safety engineer, and you have a single safety engineer. 
Uh, nowadays, now a standalone safety engineer it just doesn't do it. Used to be a uh, comment made about this person. This is the last person to know about safety problems is a safety engineer. That statement is obviously not true. Safety engineers are very capable people. Safety committees is the safety structure. In, what is the safety structure inside your company? Does the management listen to their engineers? The new view, everybody's a safety engineer. In some companies, this is, has taken place, but in other companies, perhaps not. The collective has much more insight than just one person, even if that one person is very good. Everyone's involved, everyone's playing what I call process struggle lock homes. So the chase is on for excellent safety. Chase is on for excellent safety. Let's take a look at accidents. And what we want to do is find out the characteristics of accidents. Well, there's frequency. There's whether it's predictable or not, predictability. What sort of information there is. What sort of neglect is already taking place? And what is the level of severity? And I put these at high, low situations, right? So bad situations typically have, they're not predictable, or very little information about them. Their no, level of neglect is high, and the severity is going to, could be very bad as well. Frequency, uh, probably not very high. If it was high, you'd probably take care of the problem. So I just uh, give you a class exercise, a significant unexpected disaster. X marks the spot. Go ahead and rate your accident, see where it is. Frequency and predictability, well, these sort of overlap to a degree. Uh, different levels of accidents, just as there are different levels of safety. Types of accidents based upon frequencies, common accidents will occur every day. Uncommon accidents once in a while. Very uncommon accidents rarely occurs. Types of accidents based upon expectations, expected accidents, unexpected accidents, improbable accidents, very improbable accidents. Well, expected accidents, are you prepared? Uh, car accidents, they're lived with, so to speak. Are you prepared? Well, you've got your seat belt, you got your airbag, you got your backup uh, videos these days, or your side turn videos. You have uh, compute, more computerized uh, driving uh, capabilities to eliminate hazards. And I've noticed that uh, basically these fantastic improvements also lead me to be complacent. That doesn't, that's not necessarily a good thing to have happen. Unexpected accidents. Well, car accidents are expected, right? You have a teenager, what do you expect? Anyway, no offense to teenagers, right? I'm sure they are all very capable people. Unexpected accidents, unforeseen, but occur frequently. Often happens for logical reasons, by the way. May have a scientific explanation or mechanism. May occur when people are not thinking. Hindsight, it's often obvious why the event happened. Safety should be prepared to handle the unexpected. Example of an unexpected accident, right? Large freight train wreck occurred above a gas line, gasoline pipeline. It was buried 12 feet below. Nobody expected the wreck, the wreck to damage the pipeline. The leak lay dormant for three months. After that time, there was a huge explosion. So can you imagine a train wreck causing a pipeline rupture? 12, 12 feet below the surface. Interesting. Huh? So you have expected unsuspected has to do with human perception and human opinion. 
Unexpected events can be probable, maybe a first of a kind, but then again, maybe often repeated. Maybe quite ordinary if conditions are ripe. Maybe quite out of the ordinary if conditions are not ripe. Frequency and predictability sort of overlap. The more things happen, the more you can expect them to happen. Improbable accidents. Well, has to do with probability, not so much with human opinion. Unlikely to happen, but are known to happen. Happens at very low frequency. For example, icebergs. It's known that icebergs hit boats from time to time. It's also known that often the icebergs do very little damage. It was very improbable that iceberg would hit the Titanic and sink her, an important item to sink her. Collision was unforeseen, was unforeseen to be significant. Safety needs to prepare for improbable accidents. Example of improbable accident, fish from the sky. Now uh, that's that's the rare, rare item, but it does occur for whatever physics reason it, it's there. However, fish from the sky, which kills somebody, is a very improbable accident, but it has occurred. Okay, very improbable accidents do happen no matter how extraordinary they are. They can be the absurd and the re ridiculous. They could be freaks of nature, defy explanation and reason. Their mechanism and scientific explanations are unavailable. So I leave you with a class exercise. Provide an example of a very improbable accident. Information. Well, let's take a look at information. Information levels. Uh, accidents that can be grouped according to information about them. Complete information is known about accidents. A known accident, the accident occurred in the past. No information about it. not an unknown accident that can occur that hasn't yet. Incomplete information is available. The in-between accident information, the in-between accident where information is needed. Let's go back to Donald Rumsfeld and his famous quote long, long time ago. I'm not sure what war we were in, but he was the Secretary of Defense, I think. There are things that we know that we know. No unknowns. There are no un unknowns. That is to say, there are things that we now know we don't know. So that requires some study. So that are known unknowns. But there are also unknown unknowns. And it's kind of kicker here. There are things we don't know. We don't know. Right? That's the one, unknown unknowns. So when we are do the best we can and pull all this information together, we can then say, well, that's basically what we see as a situation that is really only the known knowns and the known unknowns. Each year we discover a few more of those unknown unknowns. So if we look at the four possibilities, known known, unknown unknowns, basically this means you're not educated and known unknowns. No unknowns means you're educated. No and unknown knowns, uh, unknown knowns is something that you should do for the future. And unknown unknowns, uh, you don't have a clue about. Unknown unknowns are likely due to poor education insight. Maybe it's due to other, excuse me. Unknown knowns are likely to be due to poor education insight. Known unknowns need more information about the unknown. Unknown unknowns, there we go, are likely to happen. We have no idea that they're coming, right? So it's very important to recognize that. What safety programs cover? 
well, no one knows, no one knows, and no one unknown what the safety programs don't cover. Unknown unknowns. So we have a ma true source, major accidents, unknown unknown. Surprise. This is why there's a surprise associated with accidents. Unfortunately, many accidents are due to the fact that you know the problem, but you don't take any action about it. So, you know, no unknowns may be a source of accidents as well. For example, you know, dust can have a dust cause a dust explosion. So you know dust is a hazard and it causes dust explosions. But your plant lives with this dust. It's everywhere in the plant. So it's just waiting for it to go off. But anyway, uh, major source of accidents, unknown unknowns. And another major source of accidents is essentially inactivity, right? Unfortunately, this category exists and accidents will occur. What can you do? Well, you have to clear unknown unknowns somehow. In other words, you are in a continual learning state on how things can cause accidents. So I have this little signpost in here. I'm sure there's more reasons, more causes than three for accidents, but we have don't think, I didn't think, I didn't see, I didn't know. What the fourth one should say is I did not understand. You may, uh, getting back up here, see you may know it. Let's go back one more still. You may sit up in this region here and you know it but you don't understand it. You know that dust explosions occur. You know your plant's filled with dust. So uh, just because you know something doesn't mean you understand something. It's very important between knowledge and understanding, right? And after knowledge uh, and understanding comes wisdom, which uh, oftentimes is lacking in dealing with accidents. So I claim that there's uh, dilemmas in safety. These are only a couple of them. There's many dilemmas in safety. Unknown unknowns is the first dilemma. Second dilemma is uh, you never know what accident you prevented because of your safety program, right? You never know what accidents you prevented because of your safety program. Safety is looked down upon because it's not a profit. It's not, it's not making any money for you. But, oh, but it is, it lets your plants survive and exist without being exploded, not being uh, participating in an accident. Anyway, I like this one as well. Once an accident or disaster starts, you don't know, the word no is missing here, you do not know where it will stop. Accidents in one area lead to accidents in another area leads to accidents in the third area. Anyway, we call these um, major accidents black swans. If you go to on uh, YouTube and type in two, T2 laboratories, interesting, it was an accident that essentially killed three or four people. The plant was producing its 175th batch. So it was grown accustomed to the problem. Uh, excuse me, they've been accustomed to the behavior of their reactor. And after this, you know, accident happened, killed a lot of people or some people. So complacency is uh, really. really missing in the T2 accident. Bad design is, is very prevalent in the T2 accident. Relying on one source of cooling is very bad uh, situation in a T2 accident. Your process was telling you through prior experience they had elevated temp, rapid elevations in temperature, which they ignored as being insignificant. 
So there was a lot of things happening that were terrible in T2, in the T2 accident. It's just, uh, a bad situation run amok. So we have uh, Chicago Clubs winning the World Series of baseball. Is that going to be a black swan? I think they did, right? I'm not sure. This is 2020, February 10th, 2020. So I suspect very improbable events happen. Very improbable events happening. So if we take a distribution, right? But we're out, we're out here at the 1%, 0.1%, sorry. Again, if we look at this, way out here past 15, 16. Don't understand what happens in the tails. It's basically the problem. And log normal, we still have distribution in tails way, way out there. These don't go to zero. Okay. And again, we have this event right here. So the fourth uh, problem, uh, fourth dilemma of safety, highly improbable events happen. Are you ready? Are you ready? There's a good thing here though, uh, accidents in the extremes, right? Accident extremes are difficult to maintain and ev accidents eventually do end. It's just that you're not quite sure where they're going to end at. So you're left with this question, are you ready, right? So that's a very interesting question. There is a significant uh, unpredictability out there. It leads to pleasant surprises, unpleasant surprises and experimental discoveries. Significant unpredictability, uh, unpredictability and filtration is famous shut down your plant with uh, your filter cloth being slimed. Uh, mixing can also be very unpredictable. The idea of uh, in the pilot plant, or excuse me, in the lab, everything went fine in the plant, everything balled up on their impeller. Now that was a very unsafe situation. Unsafe conditions may occur when the process is not doing what it's supposed to do, what it's expected to do. Okay, unpredictability in operations can be on major and are majority safety issues. So we're left with this dilemma, it's all I didn't call it dilemma. Even the most knowledgeable and insightful people lack the ability to see the outcome of a sequence of events yet unknown, right? Even the most knowledgeable, insightful, and we'll throw in uh, most understanding type of people still don't know the outcome of a sequence of events that are yet unknown. Can't predict the future. Anyway, uh, level of neglect. How much have you uh, neglected things? What's your concern level? And then, of course, the level of severity here. Well, accidents which happened because nobody was paying attention to, paying attention. Little or no commitment to safety, that's common by the way. Yeah, you have your monthly safety meetings, but uh, not, not was not foreseen as a problem. So what problems are you neglecting? One of the interesting things about problems is you have a problem, you don't pay any attention to solving it. You need a new and different viewpoint. Some app accidents are simple, not important, like minor spillages. At the other extreme, some accidents are very severe. And again, we let you know that major accidents change everything. You've killed people, you have no place to work the next day, process is gone, production's gone. So you really have harmed yourself by not paying attention. Now, obviously you're gonna to have to fight some politics here. 
you know. You got to be um, all kinds of politics out there, right? So, leave you with this. Know the risks. Well, that would be nice if that's true, if you could. But sorry, you're not going to know all the risks. So let's go on. Now then, what I really like is accident scenarios, right? Oh, let's go back here. Accident scenarios. One way to handle accidents is you have plan A, plan B, plan C, et cetera. You have more than one, of course. Plan ahead, be prepared, anticipate, and practice. Uh, suitable robustness, robustness, nimbleness, flexibility are needed. Hopefully, overall capability of delivering safety is increased. Problem is scenarios do not cover the particular accident in hand. Probably not effective for evolving accident and may be ineffective against unsuspected, improbable, or very improbable accidents. For example, feed variations. Feed variation is a common occurrence. Your feed's not what you expect it to be. So as a result, your processing has to go down a different route. So what are the accident scenarios for the different feeds that you have or have not encountered yet? Trapped iron, for example, uh, you have trapped iron going through a crushing mill, jams up the uh, equipment. So then say a roll crusher, trapped iron can't go through, cuts off your feed for the rest of the plant. Well, you design such that spring-loaded wheels will let the trapped iron go passing through. Accident scenarios are similar to military strategies. Kind of interesting. Also, football plays, what have you. Comment uh, military strategies are effective up until when you have the first contact with the enemy. No plan. <laughs> we have a German military strategist. No battle plan survives contact with the enemy. And when an accident occurs, the scenario, your accident scenario, meets reality. Hopefully, though, there's a good match, but reality is going to win. Reality goes according to this uh, scenario is a big question. Here we have Mike Tyson with one of his famous quotes. All right. <clears throat> so why have, why have accident scenarios? Well, accident scenarios help you prepare to be ready. Luck visits those with a prepared mind. That's a quote from Einstein. I'm sure it was said before Einstein, but anyway. All are practice items. Accident scenarios, military strategy, baseball practice, athletic training, fire drills, etc. All practice. Practice makes perfect. The unknown outcomes, of course, the winner of a war game, football game, elections. For accidents, you don't know the outcome, but you can be prepared. Being prepared, it helps. So the question we are left with, think, think ahead, plan and be ready. Right. Think ahead, plan and be ready. All right. Much like playbooks in football, of course, you should play what happens games. What happens if we have a twister coming through the plant? What happens when we have a power failure? What happens when the equipment is struck by lightning? What happens when there's a flood? There's some interesting accident scenarios of plants that have been flooded, which then sets off a sequence of events that were un unanticipated. Logical sequences for safe shutdown, fail safe operation. I like this concept of fail safe. Okay, let's hope it does, is the big question. 
I recommend, highly recommend that you uh, review all the videos by the Chemical Safety Board. I have, I think there's one in there that shows uh, a plant that's essentially flooded and uh, floodwaters keep on rising and cause uh, problems. Moving ahead, uh, we have accident hunting, okay? Uh, I don't know if you all do that or not, new concept, or is it the same old, same old, same old, same old? Accident hunting. What is the source of the start of an accident? It's much like playing process Sherlock Holmes. In history, certainly helps, right? So we have earthquake hazard, home hazard hunt. Do you have a home has? excuse me, do you have a hazard hunt for your processes? What processes are they been visually identified? Have your people become aware of it? Do you include this in weekly or monthly safety meetings? Okay. Where is the history? Where is, what is the history and where is the history? And again, I highly recommend you view the Chemical Safety Board videos on YouTube. Excellent. And we have the National Fire Protection Association, numerous manufacturer user codes, and of course we have the British sources. So what is the history? In the development of the TIO2 uh, process inside DuPont, right, the TIO2, they basically, TIO2 is exploding bomb. Basically, the process was a bomb. And after many, many tries, after many, many accidents, and after many, many rebuilds of their equipment, they eventually figured out how to run it, right? But uh, they had to persevere through accident after accident. Accident hunting goes hand in hand with preventive maintenance, right? Safety and being safe, need an extensive checklist, troubleshooting lists, et cetera. Troubleshooting lists are things that can go wrong or potential solutions. Here I lifted this from uh, Riggs's book, Chemical and Process Bioprocess Control. Common problems with the final control element, right? And here, there's a whole bunch of problems that can happen. One of these problems that happens could wind up causing this be a source of accidents, leaking, for example. Another one for components of a sensor system, possible problems for controller DCS systems. So, I would institute uh, uh, accident hunting program inside your company. I don't know if you have one or not. Sources of accidents, well, accidents can come from inside the plant and outside the plant. What if games and what happens games? Right. Again, uh, troubleshooting is closely aligned with accident prevention. What is wrong? What's changing? That's extremely important. What's changing? If things change, it means they may go into processing regions you don't wish to go. What has changed? What has been tolerated or covered up and or covered up? Okay, where is the troubleshooting list? What are the different levels of protection? I think DuPont has two or three levels of protection. Maybe you need more than that. Process troubleshooting closely aligned with process Sherlock Holmes. What has changed? Well, my uncle Gene worked for Eastman Chemical, great company, Eastman Chemical. He had a very good life there. But he walked by, he would go to lunch and he would walk by this one, one unit. And uh, 
he would see orange smoke coming out. And he's walking by, and being an organic chemist, he was an organic chemist, he was wondering why the smoke was orange. He couldn't necessarily figure that out. And uh, the next day, uh, the smoke turned purple, and he didn't realize or want to know why. He didn't understand why it was orange to begin with, and then he didn't understand why it was purple and changed. The next uh, day, there was a big explosion. I'm not sure this color change in smoke was actually this, right? Tennessee Eastman explosion in 1960. But I remember the explosion uh, in 1960. It's not necessarily this, this explosion here. But 1960, my mother spent all morning uh, or all day trying to figure out whether Uncle Gene was still alive during this explosion that hit Eastman. And fortunately, Uncle Gene did survive. A little case in point, I think I was 10 years old then. And so that was my first process, uh, first experience with process safety. This is classic uh, hover cover. Now, a hover cover is a, sort of a specialty term for uh, covering over an impeller in a stirred tank. Anyway, it was used to improve gas liquid contacting. We can go into detail about it if you wish. But they went in and cleaned the reactor out, checked it out. And they did not reinstall the hover cover. So uh, the performance dropped dramatically after maintenance happened. Uh, this forced them to, the company involved, forced to use a hydrogen compressor, basically to, instead of having the hover cover do the job, they had to put in a recycle of hydrogen recycle compressor main to get the performance they had before. So interesting. Going back to Uncle Gene, it's pretty funny. Again, he was an organic chemist. When he got older, 60, 65, there's shards of glass, little tiny shards of glass would come out of his face, eventually working their way out. And he, Uncle Gene apparently has been in several, several accidents, one where he was badly scarred. The little shards of glass went into his face. It's pretty interesting. They all come out after getting older there. Interesting. Honesty, safety, and honesty combination. Anyway, significant reduction in performance after maintenance did not return the reactor to the original configuration. Hey, I, I, maintenance is a good set of guys. You know what I mean? Guys and gals. They're, 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 they do their work, you know? But... Uh, Nobody was able to explain the drop in performance. Was anybody paying attention? They added the compressor, right? So inside the plant, well, chemical plant can be divided into string of connected unit operations. So you can play accidents hunting games. Okay, so you want to, can be a source or start of an accident, receiving areas feed preparation areas, anything wrong with that? By the way, feed, uh, obviously you gotta watch out. You have feed variations. Are you monitoring the feed variations? Feeding steps, feeding and contacting, All right, house feeding and contacting done. All right, separation steps, cooling steps. What happens if you lose cooling water, do you have a backup? or a secondary cooling method. Handling, uh, obviously static charge is important. Is everything grounded? I was going to develop a course on static charge, build up, got halfway through. The mathematics got me. I found out that I was not an electrical engineer. Anyway, I'm just kidding you. I didn't. Persevere. Anyway, in the effort. But I, I think that uh, 
the key item with static electricity is whenever you have a flow, right? You have the potential for static electricity accumulation, static charge accumulating. The more flow, the more friction, the more friction, the more static charge can happen. And as a result, you can have differences in electrical potential, which leads to sparks or leads to current. And current is uh, another name for current is sparks. So control is special. Right. Control is special. So safety and control ought to go hand in hand. And control has different levels. So loss of control, to what degree is the loss of control? Is it local, analog, digital, going higher? Loss of going higher up. Loss of instruments, instrument air, plug lines. Again, the control book by Riggs has a lot of these troubleshooting into indexes. Another view inside the plant, well, you have each of these as a sort of start of an accident. Personnel, procedures, materials, energy levels, and equipment. So you have the different steps in the unit operation and then coming across the side matrix, you can perhaps have these. So at the top, you have the different types of processes. Along the side, you have personnel, procedures, material. So you have a sort of matrix. Human factors, safety statements about personnel. Well, again, we got a human beings here. Uh, personnel often do not know what's inside their processing vessels. That's probably fairly accurate. If you go in and clean a process vessel, you should videotape it. Maintenance sometimes does not completely restore the interior of equipment after services. Example of that, a maintenance crew went into a glass line vessel, dropped a hammer, cracked the glass, right? I started up the reactor. Next day, there was a new hole in the metal wall of the reactor because the crack in the glass allowed material to go to the metal wall and the metal wall was eaten through. Quite dangerous stuff. So obviously now you have a spill, you have a, hopefully a drip pan. Hopefully it's uh, piping and instrumentation diagrams are often wrong. Right? Lines may have to be traced because labeling is wrong. You need to understand exactly what you have. right? And statements like these do not help in safety. Operators may be new. Operators may be adventuresome. They may be inattentive. They may be bored. bored. They may be daring. Operating procedures are not understood and not followed. Different operators will perform the same procedure differently. That's interesting. Some operators do not follow procedures and are off on their own. It's funny, I was at one plant one time, I sat down with the good, the good friend of mine, the director of research, and I asked the people in charge of the unit what they were doing, and they stepped through the different things that they were doing. And the director, my good friend, kept on saying, you're not supposed to do it that way. You're not supposed to do it that way. You're not supposed to do it that way. Anyway, what can I say? New, nothing wrong with new. Adventuresome, there was nothing wrong with being adventuresome. Daring, well, these are nice qualities, but not in the safety arena. Not in the safety arena. Process operating procedures are not followed. That's mm. statements like these do not help in safety. Human factors, right? Poor communications occur all the time. Poor communication occurs all the time. Safety risks increase. There's a conflict between production and maintenance. Right? Production wants to push the equipment. 
maintenance wants to protect the equipment. So you have that conflict. Example, this is coming out of a major, major oil company. There are people that just essentially tell me, if you ain't burning, you ain't learning. Right? If you're not pushing your equipment, then they ain't learning. Right? So there's a real problem with that too. I mean, yes, you went to highest production. Yes, you're going to be reaching safety limits. But I hope you don't learn the hard way, you know. Cause of many accidents, not invented here. Uh, you have these huge, huge egos. Uh, you have huge arrogance. Uh, you may have knowledge, but no understanding. There are uh, no appreciation of the possibilities. People are bored, unconcerned, and inattentive. Anyway, so the not invented here attitude is quite interesting. Again, I like to learn from everybody. You know, when I walk in, I'm all ears on everybody, right? So procedures are poorly written and incomplete. You can bet on that. New processes and retrofits, the procedures are not fi fixed. For new processes, procedures need to be explored to get the work, to get the process to work as expected, optimized. Statements like these do not help in safety. Okay, the last three areas that you might look for problems for safety. Accidents is the materials, the energy level, and the equipment, right? Again, we already said feed is a variable. The energy level hopefully is constant, but it, you may lose power. You may uh, lose, on the equipment side, you may lose cooling water. You uh, obviously have taken those into account, I hope. You should also recognize procedures should change with size. Lab procedures are not meant for plant. Plant labs should be quite different. And they should have procedures uh, for startup, normal operations, shutdown procedures, possibility of non ordinary and unusual events. T2 accident, they lost cooling water simply because they relied on city water and the city water wasn't available. It's sort of like if you take a look at electric cars, right? Electric cars are really great until the power goes down. Out in California, you have all those fire damaged regions out there that have no power and they can't charge their electrical cars. Start up or non-ordinary unusual events, lines plug, freeze, run dry, stratify, leak, etc. Right. For example, oh, we can go to this reactor plugs. The material will leave another way. Runaway reactions solidify material inside the reactions. You have powder and dust explosions due to spark. Improper grounding causes sparks during transfer. Again, transfer means static charge. Lots of utilities. Okay. Power, steam, heating, cooling, agitation, compressed air, instrument, leaks, pumps, leaks, pumps, compressor, steam. Did you just lose your mechanical seal on your pump? And how much leakage has occurred? Lines not clean, purged of dangerous material. Hopefully your fail-safe systems, or I should say, it's not uncommon for fail-safe systems to fail unsafely. Okay. It's not uncommon for fail-safe systems to fail unsafely. 
Critical speed issues, natural frequency issues. I don't want to be around in any machine that has a natural frequency. It's operating at its natural frequency or critical speed issues and weather, unusual weather conditions. Okay. Let's run through. Let me throw out a few examples here. Bottom valves are, meticulous, are particularly notorious for line pluggages. So you have an agitated tank, perhaps, at the bottom. You have a, some flange here, a nozzle, exit nozzle, and then you have a control valve. And the control valve shuts the shut. So this place uh, tends to be a debris collector for solids. What you don't want to do is have the solids uh, collect because over time, the solids have a trouble, uh, have, have the tendency to fuse together. Take uh, hard candy around Christmas time. Hard candy around Christmas time, you reach in the candy bowl, everything is separated. Around February, after two months of collecting moisture from the air, the uh, individual Hard candies are now fused together into one big block. Okay. Case in point, this one company uh, used this configuration for a premix tank. So uh, for polymers, right? So they had the uh, monomer sitting in there and they added initiator. That's a later story, but I'll tell it now. Uh, they didn't have enough initiator. It was Christmas time, so they decided to uh, wait until after Christmas and get more initiator. The procedure said to drum it off. And well, they said, well, what's the difference between a drum and a tank here, premix tank? And so they didn't follow the procedure. They just left it in the agitated tank there. And after all, I mean, nothing is going to change on you, right? But over Christmas time, this became a solid. There was a small react, uh, enough initiator and enough monomer down here that became a solid plug. And when they came back, they added an initiator to the liquid. Okay, and finished it off. And then they tried, this is a premix tank, then they tried to push it to the reactor but there was a plug sitting here now. So the name of this equipment changed. It's no longer a premix tank. The name uh, was not official, but the name for this tank was now a bomb. It was just a matter of when it would go off. Premix tank, initiator, solid plug in the bottom, initiator, monomer. So you're gonna have a polymeric uh, reaction go on. That was 10.30 in the morning at 11.30 that night, new shift came along and the maintenance guy goes up and starts banging on this right here. Now, again, it was a premix tank. Now it's a bomb and you have the chap banging on a bomb. That's essentially what he was doing. Anyhow, uh, The reaction took off and you had uh, molten plastic. Up here, there was a manway with like 100 bolts to it, blew that thing clean off, took a bolt and twisted it back into the sidewall of the reactor. You had this little pressure relief. <laughs> Very funny how undersized uh, safety relief is. You have this little pipe going for safety, a uh, pressure relief, and it was not able to handle it. So I essentially blew the contents out of the tank throughout the entire room, covered the uh, maintenance guy with 70% of his body was covered in plastic, all because of a poorly designed bottom valve. And for one of my friends called this the killer. This is the killer. So how do you get rid of the killer? Well, you put a flush mounted valve there and that gets rid of the killer. Okay. Debris collection down at the bottom is not anticipated. It happens all the time. 
Non-ordinary and unusual events causes changes in procedure, which results in process conditions that are non-ordinary and unusual. All right. Flush mount valve will eliminate the safety hazard. Now the problem is the whole world is built on this configuration. So changing out flush mount valve is expensive. So to be completely safe, they should change out, but that's going to be too costly to do. So anyway, here's a picture I took off the YouTube. Really like these videos. Just ordinary life, a young lady fills up her gas tank. Right? So you type in gas, gas station fire, static electricity, SARS flash fire. And maybe this one as well. All again, static electricity, static electricity. And then simply. Procedures and scale up, and it's a problem. Again, we're taking a look at safety from a procedure point of view and from a scale up point of view. Procedures, sequence of actions that are done in a certain manner, established, accepted, established, acceptable way of accomplishing tasks, states what's to be done in what order, or maximize safety efficiently, see, efficiency, hopefully. But that is not all, that is not all to a procedure. There's much more uh, things to be done. Well thought out, organized, clearly written. Should be well tested, checked for accuracy. Give it to several people, read. Should be easy to execute. Part of the procedure is inconvenient. If part of the procedure is inconvenient, it won't be done. Skipped. More mistakes are going to be likely, not done correctly. Everything should become a simple, simple thing. Complexity is not your friend. You do not want to be the complex scientist, right? It's everybody's impressed by, right? You uh, want, to, want to make everything real simple. I ran across, the, thank God I didn't. How can I say this in a politically correct manner? Thank God I didn't get involved with this. I ran across the situation where there was a 20-step chemical procedure. And there was eight of those in a sequence of eight other similarly, similarly complex procedures. So in all, there was like 160 steps. So you had complex procedures inside an overall complex procedure. And basically, we needed to throw this out. Basically, too damn, too damn difficult to do. It's difficult. It's not going to be done. All right. And the other thing you should recognize is problem processes. There are things that are going to be difficult to do. All right. An example of a problem process would be adding powder to a liquid. When you add powder to a liquid, you're likely to form lumps. So there's at least two or three different ways of adding powder to a liquid that routinely get rid of lumps or not let lumps form. Instead of just dumping it in the top of the tank, use the better equipment, right? So don't do things that are difficult. Very important and process Problem processes are difficult to execute and cause problems in processing. Right. I was involved with the company. It was a 18 hour cycle time, two powder additions in the whole procedure. Took uh, four hours to get rid of one set of lumps, another eight hours to get rid of another set of lumps. So that's a total of 10 hours in lump reduction. The problem, the process formed the lumps to begin with, i.e., why give yourself more problems to work with? Figure out a way of making, dispersing the powder without making lumps. So procedures causes the problem by using ineffective methods, correct procedures, correct the problem that created, Huge amounts of time. Better add in ways that lumps are 
There are various techniques to do this. Okay. Another example of this is gas incorporation or entrained in a viscous liquid. You don't want to have this happen either. It's best not to have this entrainment occur, right? So the entrained gas can cause a number of difficulties. Product quality, you could have air bubbles in the plastic. Filling operations, inventory control. Trained oxygen can uh, oxidize your material. And wait time for gas to leave a viscous material can be very long. So you establish the fact you're not going to create this problem to begin with, right? So better to have the procedure that does not, that does not incorporate gas. Techniques are available, may be less developed or optimized. For example, operations in a sealed system, under vacuum, surface baffles, some examples are where you can operate where you will not incorporate air and viscous liquids, right? So oftentimes you run across underdeveloped procedures. Uh, many procedures are underdeveloped, need further developments. Small scale testing can be done in order to determine the viability of the change in procedure. This should be done before change is implemented. Okay, that sounds good. Why are you doing the process this way? I, procedures most often do not include the information on why. Should be added to reinforce operator behavior. Procedures may be doing things in certain ways because of product quality, increase lower costs and increase efficiency and whatnot. Safety too. Procedures may be doing things in certain ways because of safety. These safety reasons should be stated and clear. Procedures should have two columns. What is to be done and why it has to be done this way, right? What is to be done and why is it done this way? Big item. One situation, uh, inadequate procedure. This has several problems with it. Operator was told to add the material to a large reactor one scoop at the time every three minutes. He didn't like that. So he knew number about one, number one. Number two, why one scoop at a time every three minutes? This was not explained to the operator. So the operator knew what to do, but he didn't know why. Okay. So what then happened? All right. Is after two weeks of doing the procedure correctly, the operator picked up the entire bag, dumped it in the reactor. As he turned away and walked away, he didn't get very far. The reactor exploded and killed him. So, simple example of loss of life, loss of the plant, loss of business. Okay, just a bad situation. So this column should include what happens if you don't follow the procedure. Procedures do not in generally include accident scenarios, which is the third column of our, of, the of our structure for a procedure. So the columns now, three separate columns, what's to be done? Why is it to be done that way? And from number two, what accidents have happened if you weren't doing it that way? So uh, accident scenarios are extension number two, and we've given it much more detail. Something similar to has up uh, analysis should be done in your scale up procedure. Accident scenarios should include a variety of what happens games. There are many ways an accident can unfold. It should be understood as much as possible. Accident scenarios are also instructive and reinforce proper implementation of a procedure. Industry makes attempts to avoid accidents. Unfortunately, industry may not be doing enough. Time and place. <clears throat> okay. Uh, time and place of accidents or incidents are outside the realm of prediction by human beings. Some events always occur. Well, okay. 
some accidents are invited to occur. Right? Lightning rod attached to the roof, right? Lightning will strike the rod. The lightning rod is inviting the lightning strike, right? So here the place is known, the time of the strike is not known. Cause of the accident should be drawn, place where it can be controlled and handled, right? Another example, again, dryer fires. Dryer equipment should be designed to handle such fires. Follow-ups. Every procedure should have a follow-up by documentation of common accidents, prevention and minimization of scenarios. This is the fourth addition to our procedure. Procedures should follow up document entitled common accidents prevention. So the first column is what to be done, second column, why we're doing it that way. Third column is what, what happens if we don't do it that way, i.e. any accidents. Fourth column would be our comments column. Right. Uh, there is an attitude out there in uh, chemical engineering land that processes are stagnant, right? <clears throat> so you could add time to a procedure or you can take time out of a procedure. A procedure is a uh, time sequence. Each step of a procedure should be timed. Each step has a time limit in which the step is accomplished. This should be required. So we got our four columns and then there should be a statement in probably number two or number three column about the time at which this takes place. See, there's an attitude that stopping and starting a procedure or honoring the procedure of some step doesn't mean the process stops, right? You, you've stopped, right? But the process hasn't. The process is not static with time, but instead can easily change with time. You think it's just because you walked away from the process doesn't mean the process stops too. So a uh, process may be held at a certain step, a static condition, but processes are not static and may be continuing. So adding time, first off, time should be stated in the procedure. This step has to be done in three minutes. Adding time to a procedure or removing time to a procedure should be considered a major safety violation. Many examples of adding time to a procedure results in an accident. Right. Here's an operator, I'll give you the short or the skinny version of this. He had been making cough drops for two years using a kettle. He uh, basically added alcohol to the kettle, then he would add sugar. However, uh, uh, this time around, after two years, he decided after adding alcohol to the kettle, he'd go get coffee. So he went, go get coffee. 15, 15 minutes later, he returned, okay, and started the procedure up. However, unfortunately, in that 15, 15 minutes, the air, uh, the air became saturated with alcohol. A small spark was generated, which flashed the alcohol. The operator died. Accident two was that premix tank. Premix tank was fed to the reactor. It was near holiday season when they have material to complete the premix. The pre procedure stated that if it, this occurred, the material should be drained off from the premix tank and stored in drums. That's the procedure. Operators did not follow this procedure. They saw no difference between the premix tank storage and the drum storage. Well, it seems logical. Unfortunately, a plug formed at the bottom of the tank over the holidays. There's no place for a plug to form in uh, drums. Returning from the holidays, they finished adding the material, then they pushed the material. Unfortunately, at this point, the material in the prenix became a bomb. 11 hours later, the bomb went off, killing the operator. Oh, considerable damage as well. I mean, it's like four-story building, top floor, 
uh, basically became a, uh, a scene out of a horror movie. Procedures are much more complex than the simple experiments in high school chemistry class. What is to be done? Why? Accident scenarios and accident documentation. There should be also in here, adding time to a procedure, taking time away from a procedure should uh, result in a safety violation. Unnecessary steps, lengthy steps, risky steps, complex steps. These are signs of an inadequate procedure. What happens is you let the operator have more responsibility here and uh, lengthy unnecessary steps increase exposure to potential problems. Example of an unnecessary step, add and stir for 30 minutes. Actually mix things off and over in a couple of minutes. The remaining time, which may be 25 minutes, is feel good time not needed. Unnecessary, unneeded steps are quite frequent in procedures. Risky steps in procedures arise out of using risky practices. Here's one, the use of pure oxygen. You can tell that's gonna be a problem. <laughs> Again, you talk about problem processes. Oxygen, or particularly liquid oxygen, it should be avoided. And again, uh, don't <laughs> NASA, for example, used pure oxygen in one of their space capsules and unfortunate accident happened. Complex steps often lead to problems because they cannot be accomplished. Difficult steps are difficult to accomplish. Safety risks increase. Keep it simple, sweetheart. Kiss, K-I-S-S, -S, keep it simple, sweetheart, should be followed. You have complex steps, they should be revised to where they're simpler steps. Failing to follow proper constructed procedures can be devastating and expensive consequence. Those who design procedures should perform their duty to ensure proper operation, operator success, safety and company success. Procedures without good process understanding are dangerous. Let's take a look at what causes safety problems. Bad data, bad design, bad information. Okay, improperly sized equipment, living with the problem and not correcting it. Okay, bad data, bad designs, haunt engineering, unfortunately. Easily, not easy to correct entrenched information. The mixing section of Perry's handbook, for example, the first, first four editions is wrong. The next mixing edition sections are very misleading, okay? Example, bad data or I don't know if it's bad data. The data is good. It's just what they did with it here. They have a square. They're assuming the slope of this line is square. By the way, these guys are good. Don't get me wrong. They give you the data. That's remarkable. But it's the curve fit that's bothersome. Because to me, it doesn't look like a square. It looks like a cube. This square, to me, looks like a cube. I'm sorry. It's just... Uh, this one's kind of interesting coming out of mixing. This is uh, different impellers up here. Over here, you don't want to use those impellers. So they give you designs and using these impellers that you really don't want to use below a Reynolds number of 200. Okay. And up here, all the data goes flat. Looks like a very impressive slide, right? can be reduced down to a simple table. Right. Here's the impeller, this is the power number. Anyway, example of engineering that tends to be misleading. This is classic engineering design problem. Uh, process area, area processes versus volume processes. You have, uh, a, heat removal process, which is dependent upon area. 
and then you have the size of the job, okay, which is L cubed. You have L squared, L cubed. And so on a large L, one over L becomes smaller. In many cases, the worker disappears. The reworker redu uh, is reduced or disappears on scale if the process will fail. So let me give you a calculation. Not too hard here. One, five, one, two, and five. The worker to the size of the job. The capability of the worker is diminished significantly if it's geometrically similar systems. This is particularly important that geometrically similar systems will lead an L squared process to become diminished in comparison to volume. This is everywhere in, in engineering. Very important to recognize that. You also have this, uh, the idea of geometrically similar processes. You do not have to have geometrically similar processes. You should improve your process on scale up, right? Should improve your process on scale up. Famous quote, well, we could do it in the lab. I don't know why they couldn't do it in the plant. Well, if you keep everything geometrically similar, this is what's gonna to happen to you, okay? So L squared L cubed ratio changes the physics. Take the physics of particles, switch from surface forces to body forces. Very small particles are surfaces controlled by surface forces. Large bodies are controlled by gravity, right? Or body forces. So you have a switch in physics here. Right. The workers often the geometric quantities such as area and length. Sometimes the worker may be even volume. But anyway, here we have heat transfer. Here you have the small scale, and here you have the large scale, basically. So the small scale, the jacket works well. There's no problem with heat transfer right, the jacket. However, scale up you have a problem with the jacket. The jacket is no longer effective, as effective on the small scale. So then you put in coils, you might pump around loop, probably doesn't work very well. The pumping of this impeller is huge compared to the pumping of this little pump here. So the impeller is huge and putting out a lot of volume. This thing is a little dingy thing. So you may uh, wish to put in heating coils. Right. You may have a uh, single phase here, no boiling. Over here, you may have boiling to get rid of the heat. Okay, you could possibly use a Bennett heat exchanger, which is a single stab right on it. However, you want a Bennett heat exchanger with a phase change. Phase change is very relevant to take away a lot of heat. Right. So heat generation, you may wind up changing your process from a non-boiling to a boiling operation. Boiling takes away a lot of heat. You could also have cooling operations perhaps as well. But see, the small scale design is quite different than the large scale design. In many cases, large scale design has not been well thought up, but well thought up and has not been tested for this L squared L cube mistake that's common common in, in uh, engineering. There's differences, major differences. Uh, well, let's go back. Additional methods for heat transfer is necessary. This leads to differences between small and large scale heat transfer processes. The area for heat transfer is often not large enough. Accomplished using a jacket small scale is not sufficient. This is often the process problem for existing scale processes. Typically, there is a desire to heat a little more or cool anymore on scale up or in the plant. Other means of heat transfer, some work, some don't. Right. T2 laboratories is notorious here. T2 laboratories was poor due to poor heat transfer limit. limit Equipment limitations became limiting. Accident was due to reliance on a single heat transfer method. Anyway, 
There should have been an additional method for e-transfer. We have runaway explosion on YouTube, plant reliability. Anyway, close out with some little pictures here. Undersized equipment, no backup. I guess this is T2 if I'm not mistaken. All right, explosion of T2, heat producing chemical reaction out of the control. Natural convection, kind of interesting. Natural convection is, have saved many a person's life, by the way. Natural convection is not usually thought of, but can be important on this, and not noticed on the small scale, not important, but may become very important on the large scale. Okay. Plan startup, dangerous time. Lots of firsts. Procedures for startup, pump turned on, vessels are filling, equipment operating first time. Equipment may be heated or cooled for the first time. Process failures will occur. Shutdowns, the last, same in reverse order. Shutdowns, dangerous time. Lots of lasts occur, right? Startup, this one comment, uh, basically. Ethylene oxide reactor, everything went perfectly well. Process control equipment said everything functioned properly. Unfortunately, nothing came out. They opened up the reactor or substantial portions of unreacted uh, ethylene oxide, nasty stuff. Just because you have process control equipment doesn't mean they're telling you the truth. Right? In process design, process control is often done at the very last moment. Control measurements may not be performed at the most representative location. Line pogging is always a problem. Gas line reactor already said, drop the hammer, left a crack, a new hole in the bottom of the reactor. Glass relatively inert, it's often used line reactor. Unfortunately, mechanical damage, sensitivity, glass temperature, safety issues. One another one here. Uh, these operators were sanding down or yeah, basically sanding down stainless steel to get the stainless steel uh, smooth. And during a stainless steel had nickel in it and there was a fine dust, so they didn't uh, wave, uh, wear safety goggles or safety respirators. They were breathing in nickel and nickel affects the nervous system after a while. Anyway, I like this one here. I don't know. I challenge you to figure out what movie this came from. Very fantastic movie. Fail safe systems in control. Yeah. Cooling water to an exothermic reactor. You want to have it fail open. Feed valves, you want to have fail closed. Fail safe may be a difficult, great idea, but may be difficult to do. Accidents go their own way, which may not be foreseen. Rumor has it, I don't know if this is true, but I'm gonna to toss it out anyway. Nine safety systems failed at three, hour, three mile island. Really astonishing. Again, uh, dryer fires, we'll go back to that one. You may think you're cutting off oxygen, but you gotta realize dryers will leak 30%. Dryers leak a lot. So if you have, uh, you're gonna cut off the oxygen, right? You may not cut it off because the got the dryer has lots of leaks in it. Plus if you heat your, if there's a, dry, a dryer fire, you're gonna be heating your ductwork and the ductwork may open up to surroundings, which increases more oxygen. So, uh, Hot metal walls, can't we stand the temperature extremes may debuckle. Fail safe is not obtained. Dryers leak a lot, so dryers may be difficult to put out. Double wall tanks for corrosion. Fail safe, not obtained if tank is not emptied at some point. The first tank is already corroded away leaves the second tank. It's only a matter of time 
before the second law goes. Right. Unfortunately, most materials will corrode. Safety problems with that. Our one ultimate game is game playing. Safe conditions. So we have this here. All right. Caution. System termination. I don't know exactly where this came from, but it's quite humorous. And an emergency seconds count. You know what to do. Okay, I need tech support right away. Yes, I'll hold. So you have core eruption in three seconds. I like this one, asking for it. Situation, asking for it. Uh, nuclear reactors built on the sea, by the sea. Over fault lines are both. Fukushima nuclear power plant built along the sea on coastal fault lines. Holy tamale, I'm just asking for it. Obviously, hurricanes along the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast are not good for beach houses. Total reliance on technology? Wow, that's going to be real scary. What's really scary is they have these autonomous vehicles that drive themselves. That's going to be a lawyer's uh, <laughs> trial lawyers are going to, I mean, um, well, ask, ambulance chasers are going to have a good time with that law. Interesting question. How many asking for it situations do you have? You're just asking for it, right? Asking for it. Nature has a habit of reaching out and killing you. That's a terrible thing for me to say, but it's so true. Nature has a habit of reaching out and killing you. Anyway, asking for situations. I love this one. I think this is kind of cool. Is this asking for it or is this asking for it, right? How many asking for it situations do you have? Never underestimate man's kind, mankind's ability to make bad designs and bad choices. Different levels of control. All levels need continuous review and updating. Safety and interlocks. Quite bothersome, aren't they? Aren't they annoying? So let's disengage interlocks. Oh, Lordy. Does disengagement uh, go against procedure? Critical speed uh, issues. I don't want to be around anything that has a natural frequency, okay? Or is operating at its natural frequency. I don't know if you've been around a set of uh, vibrating. Uh, filter screens or screening operations that is natural frequency. Wow. Any process input can lead to unstable mechanical failure. You put in one and you get 10 back out. You put in 10 and you get 1,000 out. All right, this is no joke. Natural frequencies. Seal leakage, bench shafts, screens hopping apart, spray drying wheels vibrating off their mountings, spin like toy tops. Uh, I don't know if I should name a chemical company, but this chemical company in Europe had on the second floor a spray dryer. And basically the the, um, the mounting that the spray dryer was being held to the floor with became loose. And the spray dryer was spinning at a very high RPM, say 20,000 RPM, 40,000 RPM. And it vibrated itself out of the uh, settings or the mounting. And when on the second floor, it was standing there spinning like a huge top. And this thing is six feet tall, spinning at enormous speed. Bump, it jumps out of the housing on the second, between the second and the first floor was where the spray dryer sat, but it jumped up to the second floor. Then it sees a cinder wall, cinder block wall. So it goes right through the wall and lands at the bottom still rotating on the ground floor, on the ground, still rotating, and eventually it stops spinning uh, approximately a mile away from where it burst free. So there you go. You put that one in your, in your history books. <laughs> uh, critical speed issues lead to process failure, significant safety issues. 
Maintenance and service difficult around critical speed. You need to shut the thing down is what you need to do. Prediction of critical speed is not exact and critical speed issues are not recognized. Seal may not seal, seal leakage should be checked. Okay, systems do not require seals, include magnetic drives and box designs. Box signs are totally encased. No place for material leak out of. Nice stuff. Bad bag of different accidents types. Procedures, people, design, design flaws, extreme temperatures, changes in feed, feed in and out, heating, cooling, in situ, agglomeration. All right. So what do we got here? We have potential energy releases from systems, non-reactive, reactive, recognize the problem, methods of control, standard. DuPont notoriously famous for their standards, <clears throat> the safety standards. This comes from the Revolutionary War, I think. George Washington, they were making gunpowder for George Washington. And some family members were killed in the production. So DuPont decided to become a safety company. Safety came, uh, came before profits. But World War II is interesting in the Pacific, right? They purged gasoline lines. When you fill an airplane up with gasoline, the Navy would purge the line and put the gasoline, push the gasoline back to the storage tank that was in from. So all the gasoline lines on the aircraft carriers were empty of gasoline. So when they were bombed, there was nothing that uh, they bombed the gasoline lines, but there was no backflow to the storage gasoline storage tanks. The Japanese didn't have that. When they filled up their tanks as uh, planes, they left the gasoline Lines filled with gasoline, so when we bombed theirs, we uh, there was significant damage occur. So, in a sense, in a real true sense, the safety procedure from Dupont contributed to the winning of World War II in the Pacific. Troubleshooting, we already mentioned some of this checklists. Okay, we have the Exxon refinery, 2015. I'm not, uh, this is the West Fertilizer. I'm not sure where that, I thought it was West Texas, basically. Anyway, then we have, uh, excuse me. The Exxon Refinery. Okay, and we have uh, another type of thing. But anyway, and here we have this, these fantastic videos, uh, chemical safety board, right? all kinds of problems, static spark, ice from, far from ice. And this is pretty disgusting right here. That, a BP Texas City refinery. That's a pretty disgusting one. You know, and anyway, I don't know how many of these there are. Let's see. I, fire in the valley, went away reaction, deadly practices, okay. hazards of nitrogen fixation. Right. These are after the fact, right? So, <clears throat> Three accidents occur over a 33 hour period. Wow, I gotta go look at that. Anyway, there's a whole bunch, a whole number of these things. And since, you know, instead of reading a novel and going to sleep at night, you have a situation where you sit and watch one of these every night. They're about 10 minutes long, 15 minutes long at most. And after you finish watching them, you can, and be experienced, more experienced at what uh, is often encountered. So I would highly recommend that. Recommendation questions, 
questions and answers, right? What are recommendations? Who's the recipient? Right, some other neat stuff. There's different levels here, I guess. What are these levels? What do status designations mean? Awaiting response, acceptable response, unacceptable response, acceptable action, alternative action, exceeds recommended action. Anyway. I don't know why this is here. Hillary at Chemical Safety Board. I don't know who. I, for, I have forgotten who that chap is, I'm sure. Apologize. National Fire Protection Association. Good idea. Get acquainted with that sort of stuff. And uh, explosion protection. The whole slew of things out there. The AICHEs. AISDHE runs a spectacular safety courses as well. And I uh, highly recommend that too. You must realize one bottom line, safety is a function of management. Anyway, <laughs> excuse me. We were gonna stop here. And I hope you enjoyed the uh, video or on safety. I hope it uh, saves you from uh, having an accident.